everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, we're excited for our next seminar in our weekly series. So to start off, we want, I want to introduce our, our GSC leadership team. So Roshan and I are the co-chairs this year. Uh, Roshan isn't here right now. He has office hours for his class, for his lab. Um, we also have our publicity team consisting of Reza, Rajmahan, Tarun, and Rachel. Uh, which Rachel, Rachel is representing today. Our support team con consisting of Anirban, Emmanuel, Meghna, um, which does a lot of, a whole lot of work for us, just like everyone here does. And then our correspondence is mainly headed up by Robert, who's also here today, and Professor Farouk Mystery. He's our faculty advisor and does a whole bunch of work for us, helps guide us in the right direction. Gr super grateful. Um, but we want to send out an open invitation for anyone else to be a part of our, our team meetings. We hold them on Fridays at 4 p.m. And this year we hold them via Zoom, to keep everyone safe and make sure everyone's able to attend that wants to. So if you'd like to attend, just shoot an email to Roshan or I at these uh, addresses or both of us um, so that we can both respond to you. And then we also wanna invite you to join our Engage group. Uh, this is, was previously held or conducted through OrgSync, but this is how we keep track of members of the GSC. It really helps us um, like it, it, when we ask for funding, if, if we have more members, they, look, they consider that as a factor. It only takes a couple seconds to sign up. You can either use this link or scan the QR code. So I'll leave that up just for a few seconds if anybody wants to scan the QR code and join. And uh, I'll also share the link in the chat in case you want to join later. So we'll move on now. Uh, I also recommend checking out our uh, GSC Facebook page. We have pictures and, and uh, events from previous, or pictures and, and things from previous events. And we also announce our future events, our future seminars, or anything else that we're doing on there. So it's a great place to get connected if you want with the GSC and just keep track of what's going on. And so, so for uh, the next two weeks, we have more seminars. Next week on Thursday, we have Andrew Hortland from Johnson Controls, uh, which is here in Norman. He's gonna share with us some lessons that he's learned from the industry. And then the week after that, we have Carolyn Seepersad from uh, Texas, which she will be presenting on uh, additive manufacturing, the process aware design for additive manufacturing. So we welcome everyone to join us for those two seminars. We'll be sending out our usual Zoom links. And if you haven't get, gotten any of those, uh, please send an email to Roshan or I, or Anyone in the GSC leadership team will be happy to help get it set up so you receive future emails. And then today we have Dr. Chin um, presenting on 3D printing and opportunities for collaboration. He's from Iowa State University and uh, the Department of Industrial and System Manufacturing Systems Engineering. And uh, before we get started, is there anything that you that I missed that you'd like to announce, or Dr. Liu, if if there's anything you'd like to add? Otherwise, I will hand over the the screen and the microphone so we can get started. Maybe we can uh, get started. Thank you, thank you, Ronnie, for the introduction. I will uh, share my screen so that we can get started. Can you all see my screen clearly? Yes. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is uh, Han Tang Quinn here. So you know, usually I go by my last name, it's just with Quinn, so it's easy for people to say. So uh, today Sorry I- Sorry, I messed that up. That, that's fine, <laughs> totally okay. 
So today's topic is about 3D printing at Iowa State University. So I want to introduce some, uh, some of my ongoing projects and so you can uh, be aware of the topics that we are working on and trying to see if we can uh, you know, uh, find some collaborations between ISU and OU. And then um, you know, we can, I will also briefly talk about the challenges in this field. So I joined Iowa State University in the year of 2017. Before that, uh, I worked at uh, Georgia, Southern State, uh, Georgia Southern University for one year, and I graduated from uh, NC State University at Raleigh in uh, uh, 2016. And over here is when my, my you know, research website. You know, I also create a QR code in case anyone want to look through my information over here. So if you have any questions or want to uh, discuss anything, feel free to stop me anytime. You know, we can have a discussion. This is, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is, uh, should be a more in interactive, you know, discussion if you'd like this way. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, previously two weeks ago, you know, we had a football game together. Forget about the football game. You know, I I'm here to bring love and peace and bring, you know, new collaborations. Okay, so we are all big 12. Uh, this is uh, the outline of my talk. I will quickly give a background introduction to discuss what is 3D printing, just for general public purpose. And then I will, uh, you know, talk about uh, you know uh, five different areas I'm currently working on. The first is uh, 3D concrete printing that is used for civil engineering applications. Second is uh, biomaterial printing that I'm working on. That is mainly for pharmaceutical and biomedical applications. I know uh, a lot of faculty in our department is currently working in biomedical areas. So maybe we can find some collaboration over there. I will also talk about 3D metal printing and the research on my group is mainly fo focused on in-process and in-situ monitoring and quality assurance. Uh, I will also cover uh, micro nanoscale 3D printing with a focus on flexible electronics. Finally, I will uh, talk, introduce some of my education effort related to manufacturing. So overall, I just want to show you in a broad way of what we are doing here at Iowa State University on 3D printing studies. So that's what I've been uh, you know, involved with and trying to seek for the collaboration, kind of long-term collaboration between Iowa State University and uh, the University of uh, Oklahoma. So that's the goal here. To begin with, you know, uh, I want to briefly cover the three different types of manufacturing processes. We have at least uh, two audience who has a bachelor degree in history. So I thought this may be some knowledge that you may want to know. First is uh, for manufacturing processes. In general, we have uh, three different types of manufacturing process. So uh, the first one you are seeing is called form formative process where we can use high temperature to melt the metals and pull the melted metal into a cavity. And once the metal solidifies it, it will have the reverse shape of the cavity. So this is the metal casting concept we are talking about. So uh, you know, casting is, has a long history. You know, in the old days, the blacksmith they make the you know swords and everything using formative process. Subtractive process means to the machining process where we can use a sharp tool to remove the material from the raw raw material. The material removal process will give us to the final desired geometry we want. This is called subtractive manufacturing. And finally, we get into the additive manufacturing age. It's not long here. It's only existed in probably the last 30 years where we use uh, uh, the concept of uh, layer by layer manufacturing to make the parts. That's the concept of additive manufacturing. And my research is really focused on in the area of additive manu manufacturing. We call it the name additive manufacturing now. Previously, you know, the 3D printing is a more uh, acceptable you know, terminology for most uh, general public. So 3D printing kind of equal to additive manufacturing in certain ways. So that's, uh, that's the idea, idea here. And my research at uh, Iowa State University is uh, mainly focused on 3D printing uh, of different materials, process control, and uh, quality assurance. So the uh, 3D printing has been used in many application areas. I'm not sure if you can still see my video, over here, I have a sneaker. This is uh, from Adidas, made by 3D printing of the bottom stage. So this uh, is really coming into daily life. You know, of course, uh, there, there are pros and cons for 3D printing. For the for the pros, it can make very you know fancy parts. You know, it looks beautiful, and and it can make complicated geometries. 
the internal geometries is very difficult to make using traditional ways. But there are also a disadvantage is usually the, the cost will be increased, uh, you know, accordingly. For this sneaker, it is uh, $400 total, 200 per, per shoe. So that's the price for that. So you know, the, usually the price is higher. And also uh, it requires, uh, you know, certain new level of material to support the 3D printing studies. That's where I usually, you know, uh, that's where my expertise will fall in. So for the 3D printing, we have different standards to different to describe different types of 3D printing techniques. In general, we categorize 3D printing into seven different categories based on the way how things are made. Some um, parts, you know, we start with a polymer tank and then use a photo to cure the polymer into solid state. That is uh, uh, called a stereolithography. That's one type of manufacturing. Some uh, 3D printing techniques, they start with a big tank of metal powder and use high energy sources like, like laser, like electron beam to melt the metal powder to form the final geometry of the part. So some other, uh, you know, 3D printing just directly use a uh, heat to melt the polymer and extrude that through a nozzle and make the part. So those are different types of 3D printing techniques. So here I just want to give you a brief background uh, what are those different types of 3D printing techniques. If, we, if you want to learn more information, feel free to search uh, the standards that I listed on top of here. And you will be able to, uh, you know, look online, you know, go through Google to learn more about those information. Beyond the 3D printing techniques, there is a new terminology coming up in our field. It's called hybrid manufacturing. Basically, hybrid manufacturing refers to a combination of any two manufacturing processes or combination of multiple material in the same process. They are counted as hybrid manufacturing. In the study of uh, my field, hybrid manufacturing, I'm mainly trying to uh, make a combination of uh, subtractive uh, manufacturing and additive manufacturing so that in the same manufacturing system, we can achieve both functions. We can you know, print part layer by layer. We can also machine part off so that we can have more capability of making different parts within different geometries. Those are the basic background information that I want to give to, uh, to you if you are not familiar with this field. Next, I'm going to get, get down into certain projects that my group is working on so you can learn more about this idea. So we, I will start with uh, 3D concrete printing and move, move to biomaterial printing, move to metal printing and move to uh, micro nano printing. So the first uh, project I want to introduce to you is the 3D concrete printing effort here at ISU. So, uh, you know, from the literature and all around the world, there are different groups who are also working on 3D printing of concrete structures. And they are actually started to building houses using the concrete printing. Or for, 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 for example, in Austin, Texas, there, are, there is a company who works with uh, Texas A&M University start to work on 3D printing, directly printing of a house out over there. And also there are uh, studies all around the world, which means not only in the US, but in UK, in China, in France, they all have the different groups who work on this. So uh, 3D printing is moving forward, but the key question for us here, for the, for us here at Iowa, is that why do we study this in Iowa? Okay, so there are, you know, a few grand challenges for the study, uh, for the need to start 3D concrete printing in Iowa. The first is uh, for 3D concrete printing, there is a kind of a, a hidden policy is uh, each group is having their secret re re recipe for the concrete they are using. So those uh, secret recipe are not shared. So if we want to do some study here at Iowa, we do not really know what are the you know, material other group are using. So those information are not shared among different groups. Second here, second reason is here at Iowa, we are, you know, in winter, we have very, very cold weathers. So for those cold weathers, you know, they result in damage on the road. So for the, on the road, we see a lot of dents and cracks on the concrete road that we are having. So the, the, the challenge for us is, is that possible that we can use uh, concrete printing to help with uh, Iowa business, can help with the repair of the road here, over here at Iowa. That becomes our motivation. So can we utilize the possible 3D tech printing techniques to uh, solve the, you know, practical problem challenges here at Iowa. So the challenging that we are facing is that we have limited study on 3D printing of concrete 
for transportation infrastructures, especially for the repair of the road, repair of the bridges, and repair of the houses. And also there's uh, no research on 3D printing concrete uh, material in Iowa. And as I mentioned, you know, the, you know, I, actually in the United States, each state has their own Department of Transportation. Those uh, state level Department of Transportation, they do not share information with each other. So if we want to do the study here at Iowa, we have to start from the ground. We have to start from the beginning. And also the mechanical behavior is unknown. And also the application is for the road repair. So we need a process planning software package and also scanning to help ensure that we know how to repair the damaged road. Each damage may be different from one, one to each other. So we have to figure out a way to scan it. That's where this project starts. So this project is funded by Iowa Department of Transportation and Iowa Highway Research Board. So, uh, you know, the goal is to bring 3D printing innovation into Iowa. So we started to uh, work on, uh, you know, how to print the transportation inf inf infrastructures and how to achieve the road repair or bridge repair. So the study is really mainly focusing on three aspects. The first is what material do we, we, are, we are going to use. The second is what's the printing techniques? How can we make the process control over there? And then the third part is how can we achieve an automation uh, you know, in the you know, 3D concrete printing? How can we scan the damage of the road and, and come, come, come up with a repair strategy at the same time? That becomes three pillars for this uh, study. And uh, for, uh, we will start with the, 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 the fun fundamental. The fundamental is the 3D printing. So the key question is uh, which 3D printing techniques we are going to use for printing of concrete. So for concrete industry, it is, uh, you know, the material is based on thermos. So it, it doesn't take much time to figure out which is the best way for concrete printing. We are trying to align the printing techniques with the current uh, concrete business industry standards. So the most straightforward way is using extrusion-based concrete printing. Just have a big nozzle and have the concrete inside and use extrusion-based techniques to make things out. Very similar to the current, what the concrete industrial is doing. And then so that becomes our motivation. So we started to assemble the, you know, uh, kind of a, a small portable level, you know, concrete 3D printer. Because the goal is for future is to incorporate automation and robotics to achieve the scanning and the road repair. So eventually we want to make a robot out of it. So we make it a little bit more portable in this way. We start with the material testing and test the different, uh, you know, different types of cement, water to banner ratio, the powder content and the different additive and, and mixtures for the concrete, for the cement, so that we can achieve the same mechanical performance as the uh, you know, as other groups. So that's what we start to do in the beginning. So eventually we come up with a type two Portland cement plus water and the silica film and the polycarbonate super plasticizer. And of course, there will be some secret recipe. So I will not disclose this information here, but we also have our secret grout that we added into the cement to make sure that the flowability is good for printing. So over here you are seeing, you know, we have successful stories. We have uh, failing stories. Over here, what you are seeing is uh, some uh, is one example is how how you know how important the material itself it is for concrete printing. If we we do not tune the material property good enough, we will never get the you know the printing results as we want. It's very difficult. It's way more complicated than the polymer based printing or metal based printing. Because con uh, concrete, they also have a solidification time that is different from polymer and is different from metal. So, uh, uh, you know, based on our study, we started to uh, uh, trying to set up, a, you know, some relationship between the rheology property of the cement versus the printability. So we use the hysteris loop to calculate the, you know, we, we run the rheology testing of the material, we calculate the hysteris loop area and set up a correlation between the hysteris loop area of the material versus uh, the printability. The, this uh, loop area is determined by the combination of the cement, silicon film, the grout we added and the water. So uh, we have some uh, fun initial findings. This is published in manufacturing letters over here. I post the link. If you want to check more information, you can find it over there. So, uh, uh, so 
based on that study, we started to demonstrate, you know, how different uh, material will affect the final printing quality. So the biggest challenge for us is how to stack up the printed results. You know, we are printing layer by layer, and now the uh, the cement uh, or concrete is very hard to control the solidification. So it's very difficult to, st you know, to 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 stack up the each layer. You know, so we start with uh, those uh, squared hollow structures and only trying to see if they can step, step up for future printing. And, and based on the optimized, uh, you know, material recipe, we were able to print good structures. So these are good structures. So we continue using the best material combination that we find from those, uh, those studies that we conducted and continue the study by directly printing not hollow structure anymore, but printing solid structures. So eventually the concrete material is mainly used for uh, supporting different uh, you know, infrastructures. So they have to be solid inside. So the, but for 3D printing is printing filament by filament, layer by layer. So what we want to see is whether the internal structure is good enough to support future mechanical testing or results. So we started to, uh, you know, uh, to use uh, the printer that you are seeing over here to print the filament structures and then uh, trying to identify how many voids are inside and what's the mechanic what's the comparison behavior and what's the tensile behavior of the results so this work is still under review so i will not get into details uh, so uh, mainly the the work that i talked in this uh, presentation are published the results for those under review or unpublished the results I will just quickly introduce the idea and skip over here. So this is uh, some initial results. Later on, if it is, uh, in, you know, if the article is acceptable, feel free to follow up our study over here. For those, uh, uh, you know, previous two slides shows the material development and the process control for the 3D printing techniques. And beyond that, we also uh, care about the scanning results. We want to know if we, you know, if there are any damage on the road whether we can scan those damages and then uh, scan the you know, cracks, the dents, and then, then automatically come up with a repair strategy. So it can be a portable, you know, portable uh, you know, robots. This portable, 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 portable robots will have a scanning system. And also later on, we can add the printer onto these robots. So this robots is able to go along with the road and scan any cracks and dents. And if I, it identify the cracks and the dents, we can use the you know, concrete 3D printer to directly repair over there. So we do not have to stop the traffic anymore. So we can easily repair any cracks we can identify. We can also identify the cracks under the bridge, for instance, to achieve a you know, better repair strategy. So this is the scanning robot, robot effort that we are having. So I collaborated with the faculty from our, uh, from our university on developing this uh, technique. I'm not sure if you can hear the voices of the video. Are you able to hear the voices of the video? No. No, okay. No. Yeah, so I will just quickly cover it. It's, uh, basically, it is a, a structure-led based 3D scanning. It has the capability to achieve real-time scanning of the bottom surface. After scanning, it generates the three-dimensional point cloud data. The point cloud data is then transferred into CAD model. So we have the in initial information of how the bottom surface will look like as the initial CAD model. Based on the cavity and the scanned uh, cracks results, we, we can use that information to design the process planning for the, for the you know, concrete printer so that we can achieve the repair. That's the overall, overall goal here. We have uh, uh, one publication to to demonstrate how structure led system can be used to quantify the quality of the surfaces. So this is uh, the article from uh, uh, this work over here that you are seeing. These are the current uh, you know work either have been published or ongoing, but we still have a lot of challenges. First is uh, the surface quality evaluation is uh, still uh, uh, still need to be further enhanced. You know. For the 3D printing part, we do not get good external surfaces, even though the internal structure is okay. But the external surface still, you can see that wavy structure of the filaments. The mechanical performance is uh, test has been tested, but we do not currently have any modeling tool to, quanti to, to predict the, the, the mechanical performance. 
The scanning CAD model can be acquired, but how to generate the optimized repair st strategy is also unknown. Right now, uh, the automation can achieve repair, but uh, it's still, uh, there, there still have to be heavy labor involved. And the, the next is uh, for the printing itself, for the manufacturing itself, we also have uh, uh, you know, different ways to optimize the printing. For example, the change of the nozzle shape may also uh, affect the, the attachment or the bonding strength between any two layers. And how to, is there a way that we can use structure design to optimize the mechanical performance? Or is there a way that we can also achieve large scale printing? Those are all the questions to be answered. So this uh, grant, uh, you know, is almost uh, finished. So we uh, will, you know, at, on our end, we are trying to apply the phase two funding from Iowa Department of Transportation. But as I mentioned, each state have, you have, have, you know, their own Department of Transportation. So I'm, I don't know how it works at, at, at Oklahoma. Maybe it is possible that you, you can try to identify opportunities, collaborative opportunities to pr new proposals submitted to Oklahoma. Uh, uh, Department of Transportation. That's also a possibility over there. And then our publications are over here showing in, the, in this page. If you go to my website, you can also find those uh, publications over there. So um, uh, feel free to check it out. You know, the, uh, more detailed information will be revealed in these, uh, uh, you know, uh, published articles. This uh, is uh, what we have been doing on the 3D concrete printing to help to, to, help to solve the practical challenges from the Department of Transportation. The next, uh, I will move on to the next topic. The next topic is uh, 3D biomaterial printing. So I feel that this may uh, be of interest to uh, more faculty members and students from your department because uh, biomedical engineering is a uh, part of the research that I see from your website. So there will be, of course, there will be strength on both sides if we can collaborate together on this. So. Uh, you know, at Iowa State University, we do not have uh, hospitals or we do not have a college of medicine. We only have vet school. So all the studies that we can do best is on, uh, is, is on animals. But here at OU, you have, uh, I think you have hospitals, you have a college of medicine. That can be a strength if we can work together. You know, possibly to generate new um, ideas to be uh, supported by NIH or other agencies. And uh, we are all, you know, good at uh, agriculture. Um, you know, we also have good engineering infrastructures at both institutions. So there may be good opportunities over here. So next few slides, I will just tell you the story uh, on our end, what we are doing and why we are doing this. So you can see the current effort here at ISU. To begin with, uh, you know, first, uh, you know, our sponsor for the biomaterial study is currently Iowa Economic Development. So we started the biomaterial bio printing with a practical challenge. The practical challenge is related to the supporting structure used in 3D printing. For 3D printing techniques, we are making a part layer by layer. So uh, there is a practical challenge is uh, uh, if we are making part layer by layer and if there is a hanging structure of the part, or if there are inclined surfaces, usually we will have to have uh, the so-called supporting structure to ensure that we can still stack up the materials. For instance, over here, the white color of the bottom parts, you know, the, the blue color supporting structures, they are all used to support the honing over structures. Usually if the degree is more than, you know, 40 to 45 degree, there has to be support supporting structures to support the top upper layer printing. That's the, you know, pr that's the rea reality of the, you know, extrusion based 3D printing or fused the deposition modeling. So what we are trying to do is to figure out ways to better help with the supporting materials and the structures. Currently those supporting materials, they either have to be break by a tool or, they, or we have to put the, the material into a solution tank, a chemical, uh, you know, solution. To, to kind of dissolve the supporting material. So that's not, uh, you know, environment friendly. So my idea come up with uh, how can we develop new materials so that we can uh, use uh, water to wash the supporting material away without have it, having to put it into chemical solution or without having have to use mechanical force to remove the material. This may possibly jeopardize the 
uh, the, the printed structure if you use mechanical force to remove the material. So uh, I selected the cellulose as the material to, to, to kind of replace the traditional supporting materials. Cellulose is a material that is derived, derived from food. So cellulose is uh, used uh, as food additive. It ha has also been used as building materials. But in, in my case, I focus on cellulose material study related to bio, bio printing. So the material we, uh, we selected, you know, it, it's uh, one type of cellulose. I'm not covering the names. So you can just, in short, it's called HPMC and MC. Uh, you can treat them as just different, uh, you know, groups of cellulose that we are using for the bio material printing. So there are, you know, some interesting properties of this uh, material. It has the so-called reverse thermal gelation. So the form of gel, uh, they, they form gel at higher temperature and then they liquidifies at lower temperature. And uh, they are, you know, kind of a water soluble, which means uh, giving more water to the material, they will become very soft and easy to remove. That's uh, the initial uh, motivation. So we started to, uh, uh, you know, kind of evaluate how the, you know, different cellulose material can be printed or not, and what, how to define their printability. So we want to optimize the printing parameters so that we can achieve stable printing using this type of new material. So the approach that we are using is very standard. We first categorize the rheolo rheology property of the material at liquid phase, and then investigate how temperature will affect the, the rheology property. We run a printability study to identify the optimized parameters for printing, and we use a solubility test to see if this is a good re replacement for supporting structure in 3D printing. So uh, this uh, article over here below is uh, the first article, article we published that relates to biomaterial printing in our group. In that study, uh, we use, uh, also use extrusion-based 3D printing to extrude the cellulose material out. We test the material at different uh, material over water concentration. And then for the rheology property, very similar to what, they, what we did to the concrete material, we also run the, um, the, the rheology test to first identify the uh, hershey buffy model that can describe the rheology property for the cellulose material. And then we identified a range that for the viscosity that is good for uh, 3D printing. That has demonstrated good printability based on that with the printing in that range. The evaluated criteria we selected is the shift fidelity. So while after printing, well, will the part be able to maintain their geometry, maintain their 3D shapes after printing is the shift fidelity concept we are talking about. So there are high water contents in the liquid phase uh, uh, cellulose material. So during the printing, there will always be water evaporation. So if there are too much water evaporation, the but the, the printed parts itself cannot hold it, it, its geometry. Eventually, we identified the best material for printing, and for that material, we identified the best printing par parameters for the extrusion-based printing. So uh, and after you know, we were able to achieve stable printing using the new material, we started to uh, print the structures and then put them in inside the water and see how long it will take to dissolve the material. It's very straightforward. As you can see from drawing, we put the uh, supporting material inside the water after, you know, one, one, uh, zero, after one hour, two hour, four hour, eight hours, we take pictures to see how geometry changes. And it does not even have to take one hour. After 10 minutes, the material, you know, immersed in water will become very soft. So we can easily peel them off, just use hand. So that's very easy to achieve. So uh, with that being said, this idea has been successful. So uh, the concept of using this as a bell supporting structure can be achieved. So uh, you know, beyond this publication over here, we also uh, uh, applied a patent application, a US patent to patent this material itself. And then uh, uh, hopefully we can come up with some commercialized cartridge to supply to the 3D printer companies. Beyond the supporting structure, this material itself can also be used to print some uh, uh, good structures for itself. And there is a good advantage that we select the cellulose as the material for bioprinting. 
to begin with, this material itself, it is edible. So basically we can eat the material we are printing. So that's the interesting story. You know, I just tell my students, you know, just you can work overtime. This is your lunch, this is your, your dinner. After printing, just eat whatever you print. If you can eat it, you're, you, you've been successful. So that's, of course, that's a joke. You know, I, I will not, you know, uh, treat my student like that. But, you know, those materials, they are edible. So since they are edible, the next question coming into my mind is, uh, how can we utilize this uh, type of invention into pharmaceutical applications or real biomedical, uh, you know, applications? Possibly use this technique for drug delivery systems. So I started to uh, continue in this direction and, uh, you know, come up with some new challenges that, that this technique can solve. One challenge is related to a pharmaceutical application to treat the peanut allergy. So I have a coll collaborator. She is uh, the expert in peanut allergy. So for peanut allergy, in order to, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, people here in the United States who are allergic to uh, peanuts and nuts or different, uh, you know, uh, similar food. So the treatment for those uh, kind of uh, allergy is that uh, for the patient, we feed them a small dosage of uh, whatever they are allergic to. And then, you know, over time, we, we increase the dosage. So the small dosage will not affect their normal, fun you know, body functions and it will not generate serious effect. But a long time, we keep feeding them those dosages. So their allergic, you know, reactions to those uh, peanuts or nuts will be reduced. So from a long run, we can, re you know, get rid of their, um, uh, you know, uh, allergies to the, to, the, to the nuts or the peanuts. So that becomes uh, our idea is, uh, is that possible that we can utilize 3D printing to uh, uh, print the kind of tablet with uh, different dosages that can be controlled by uh, automation system so that we can print the tablets out, give it to the patient so they can take it daily and with customized dosage so that from the long run, we can treat their disease. That's where this idea come in. Uh, and over here, you know, in this image, you are actually seeing a little girl here. That's my daughter. You know, some people like me, we put our daughter into our publications. <laughs> so that's another joke. You know, my daughter is, uh, you know, my little girl, she's part of my publication. So uh, anyway, you know, move on. This is uh, the application we, we are targeting. So we started to use the cellulose material and embedded the uh, the peanuts in, in, for those uh, cellulose material and print those uh, in the tablet format. So as I mentioned, the goal is here, here is to uh, uh, create an automation system. So the doctor, they can design a customized dosage for the, print, uh, for the patient. The print, patient can have an in-home 3D printer where you know, they can press a button daily and they will get a tablet with a customized peanut amount inside of the tablet. They can take the tablet they, you know, from a long run, you know, it can be easily treated. So this is the oral immunity, immune, uh, immunotherapy that we are talking about. So for the printing part, my work uh, focuses on how to achieve the printing aspect. We uh, compare the different ways for printing, whether by use, uh, using a two extruder system to print the two material together or mix the peanut with the uh, cellulose first and then print them out. There are different, uh, different uh, um, uh, ways of printing will give us different uh, release profile. So from this study, we also uh, put the, you know, printed tablets under testing of uh, drug release. So in this case, the drug is the peanut. So we, we test uh, what's the release profile of the printed tablet and then, then uh, help us to figure out whether the concept of uh, pre-mixing is better or failing is better for the, uh, for the printing of customized uh, drugs. So this is a, a publication that you are seeing on this slide. This is a recent publication. So this is develop of a cellulose based uh, drug release dosage by semi-solid, you know, extrusion additive printing. This is uh, one of the work we are doing. And beyond that, we also, uh, for the same material, uh, we are also trying to see how different manufacturing process may enhance the printing results. Over here, I show you two more publications that we recently have. So if you want to check them out, so uh, they are, they will be, you know, one is already available online, one will be available online soon. So beyond the, you know, uh, 
uh, putting two material together. We also can use this material to print the material first and then use other techniques, other manufacturing techniques to control the microstructure of the printed patterns. So what we are doing here is uh, beyond the 3D printing, we add a post-processing process, which can control the porosity sizes inside the printed geometries. So now the microstructures can be precisely controlled. So it is possible for us to use this, uh, uh, use this technique for encapsulation of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, other materials or the encapsulation of a uh, pesticide for farm medicine. So those are the possible applications and some ongoing efforts we are having. In summary, you know, we, uh, you know, in my group, we started the, uh, the collaborative work with the biomaterial printing, and we started with the, uh, you know, a few publications together on this topic. So again, if you want to follow the articles that we are working on for this area, feel free to uh, go to my website and you will be able to find all the relevant articles over there. We also have one US patent for the material itself. So later on, if you, you have interest in uh, to utilize the technique for your biomedical applications, we can further talk on this. Okay. With that being said, that covers uh, uh, this portion of um, uh, uh, biomaterial related printing. So uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me. We can talk about that. Next, uh, I want to uh, uh, mention, you know, emphasize again that, you know, both Institute, Iowa State University and OU, they, we all have good engineering infrastructures. And we, you know, we have different, uh, you know, schools of one is for animal, one is for human and uh, medicine. So it is possible for us to think about the possibility of collaboration in this area. With that, that concludes my uh, third topic of uh, biomaterial printing. And then I will move on to the next topic. The next topic is uh, metal-based printing and the current effort. So first is uh, what do we have here at Iowa State University? So uh, for the metal-based printing, we mainly have two types of printing system. One is a powder bed, powder bed based 3D printing. This is uh, from 3D systems. So uh, the other one is a uh, 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 direct energy deposition based 3D printing. This is from hybrid manufacturing technology. So those uh, two types of uh, manufacturing techniques are utilized in different manufacturing principles. The first one, the metal bed, bed powder bed based printing start with a, a tank of metal powder and use laser to melt the metal powder layer by layer. On the other side, you know, hybrid manufacturing offers the flexibility of uh, direct energy deposition where we shoot a metal powder to the area that we, where, where we want to print the material. By shooting the metal powder and use laser to melt the metal powder simultaneously, we can print the, uh, the, the geometry with less material to be wasted. And then uh, direct energy deposition is also similar to the concept of uh, laser cladding, so just in different ways. So what we do using this technique is uh, we add the laser head inside a CNC head machine. So inside the same, same machine, we can achieve both subtractive machining and additive printing. So this is uh, the study that uh, my group is focusing on is uh, direct energy deposition based additive manufacturing and how to utilize it for hybrid manufacturing. Some background related to metal additive, additive manufacturing is uh, there are common defects in additive manufacturing. For instance, the internal voids, the porosity generation and the anisotropic uh, property of manufactured part are the common defects that is happening in the additive manufacturing field, especially for metal. So the foreground challenge identified, identified by NAST is first is uh, the characterization of the raw material, how to develop different metal powders to make added, metal additive manufacturing feasible. The second is uh, development of a design guideline for how to design the part that is easy for metal additive printing. The third one is a uh, in-situ process monitoring and feedback control to ensure the quality assurance. And the fourth part is uh, how to achieve non destructive evaluation of the final printed parts. We want to know the quality without this destroyed part for, uh, to check the quality. So my study is really focused on the third and the fourth aspect of this one. So the, uh, the project is uh, funded by uh, Department of Energy and the Remedy Institute. So the idea that we are doing, you know, the 
The objective for our group is to improve the real-time capability of AM-based NDE. We want to uh, minimize the errors induced by the additive manufacturing environment for, for in-situ data capture. And we also want to identify the approaches for data fusion. That is some topic that we mainly focus on under this project. So uh, for the background, you know, some background information is for uh, metal-based additive printing, there are a lot of studies here in the literature database where you can see the study are focusing on the monitoring of melting pool. So basically people use a, a thermal camera to monitor the temperature history of the printing and use this information to help with the prediction of the process generation or defects generation. Our innovation is different. We are not using thermal imaging. Instead, I collaborated with uh, Dr. Wen Li from mechanical engineering here at our, our state university to work on using 3D scanning techniques to achieve real-time 3D scanning. So in this case, we develop a hardware system which utilizes structure-led 3D scanning to scan the surface topography of the printed layer, uh, printed you know uh, parts. So during the printing, after we printing each layer, we apply the 3D scanning system into the printing printing area and scan the layer-wise information. This information is very significant because. Uh, 3D printing is printing layer by layer and the next layer will cover the previous layer. If we do not scan the layer-wise information, this information will be lost forever. There is no way that you can retrieve this information back after you finish the printing. So uh, over here, uh, you know, this study has been published here in Journal of Manufacturing Process. If you want to follow, you know, this is the article that you are seeing on this slide that you can refer to. We uh, start with the hardware uh, modification of the printer so that we can achieve the uh, real-time surface scanning. So we, we, you know, if you notice, this is the same scanner as the 3D scanning robot that I showed you before in the 3D printing concrete uh, application. For this one, we uh, just attach the 3D scanner inside the high CNC machine so that it can have a focus area of the printing area. Uh, we add a protect, uh, protective layer to study if uh, 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 to, to check if this is uh, uh, achievable first. And then uh, we successfully, you know, uh, collect the in-situ layer-wise data. As I mentioned, after printing each layer, we were able to collect the layer-wise information. Layer-wise information contains a lot of useful data. So first, it knows uh, the wavy structures of the printed layers. Based on the wavy structures, it is possible for us to adjust how we want to use uh, process planning to print the future layers. So some ongoing study is uh, that we are having is uh, given the previous layer wise information, how possibly that we can use the, those information to help reduce the noises generated during the scanning so that we can achieve more accurate scanning results. So that is part of the study here. So given a uh, static scanning, it is very easy for us to get a uh, good data accuracy, but for man in situ manufacturing, there are huge system noises during the manufacturing process. So the scanning results usually will not match the actual surface topography that well. So we apply Bayesian uh, algorithm to help, uh, uh, to help use the previous layer data to predict the current layer data and make a kind of a, a calibration for the data. And eventually the, 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 the uh, collected the in-situ data accuracy uh, way much improved. For this project, uh, we also trying to work on data fusion. So for the data fusion aspect, we use uh, layer-wise data information to compare with the city data. On the top, you are seeing is a printed parts and associated city data. This part is specially designed so the manufacturing process is not optimized. The reconstructed three city data shows how the internal structure will look like. The internal structure shows, shows a lot of process inside. So the goal for us is to predict the process generation based on the scan layer-wise surface topographical information. So uh, that is um, uh, some ongoing work. It's very difficult, you know, based on layer-wise information, it's very difficult to predict how the process will be generated. So further, we are trying to add a thermal camera into the current setup. So now beyond the layer-wise surface information, we can also have a melting pool information 
that, that we can get from this. So now we have thermal history, we have the layer-wise information of the printed parts, and eventually we can also have the offline CT scanning results. By uh, working on data correlation, our hypothesis is that we can use uh, thermal data combined with layer-wise data to accurately predict the prosody generation, microstructure generation, and the crites generation during the metal-based DD printing. So this is some ongoing work. We also have a few publications in this, uh, in this, in this study. Uh, again, you know, uh, if you go to my website, you can uh, find those publications related to metal-based 3D printing. So uh, uh, for the metal-based 3D printing, there are a lot of uh, future, future work we can do. So the, 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 you know, the studies as I just showed you are just a preliminary study that, that we are doing. We only achieve the in-situ scanning. We haven't even think about how to use the in-situ data to, you know, as the feedback signal to control the manufacturing itself yet at this moment. And there are so many data that we've collected in situ, including the thermal history, including the layer-wise information. How to deal with such big data is also a challenge for us. And for my group, I do not work on physical modeling of metal 3D printing. So currently we do not, uh, you know, it's also challenging only use data-driven method. So if there is uh, any possibility of combining physical modeling with data-driven modeling, it is possible to generate some more promising results as what we can foresee. Those, those are the uh, possible you know, areas that we can collaborate on the 3D metal-based uh, uh, 3D printing. So this is uh, the idea of uh, metal printing that our, our group is working on. And with that being said, that concludes the metal printing effort in my group. So next, I will move on to the uh, topic of uh, micro nanoscale 3D printing. So uh, why do we? Why do I have to care about that? You know, um, if you recall, you know, I'm not sure if you are aware that you know Apple actually released the uh, iPhone 12 yesterday. So this is uh, iPhone 12 you are seeing, and then uh, last year they released iPhone 11, and previous year they released the iPhone 10. And then if you compare the recent generation of iPhones, you will be able to realize that even though there are a change of the shape, fundamentally the phones are similar. What Apple is doing right now is increasing the you know, CPU capability, increasing the camera capability, add a few sensing techniques into the phone. But comparing the phones with the first iPhone released in 2004 by Steve Jobs, you know, it's basically the same, uh, even you know, kind of similar techniques have been applied. So what, we call, what I call it is, uh, rigid phones. They start with a rigid screen. And you know, even though we make the screen bigger, we make the you know computational speed faster, basically they are the same type of phone. We cannot call it a revolution of electronic devices. So from what I see is uh, the next uh, electronic revolution will be the concept of uh, flexible electronics, where people do not use uh, a phone with a rigid screen anymore, but using flexible films and the printed electronics on the flexible films to achieve the display functions, to achieve the sensing functions, the, the checking functions, the, you know, all those different functions. So that's where my interest in, is in. And in order to achieve those, uh, you know, applications, the idea is to achieve micro nanoscale 3D printing of metal inks. That's what my research is uh, mainly focusing on. You know, previously, even though I introduced you metal printing, uh, biomaterial printing, and uh, the concrete printing, actually my research, you know, my fundamental of my research is this micro nanoscale 3D printing. So for the micro nano 3D printing, uh, due to the time limitation, I will skip those uh, literature review section, but briefly, you know, show you where the studies have been going for the study of micro uh, nanoscale 3D printing and printing electronics, there are a few big groups. For instance, you know, in the northeast corner, there is a Xerox. Xerox is the printing company who focuses on this. Corning has uh, display techniques. And the Behemoth University and Harvard University, they all have groups, you know, famous groups to study the printed electronics. And we also have stud, you know, researchers from the, uh, south, uh, from the southwest corner. Uh, such as uh, Arizona State University, 
Fujifilm, Apple, these rocks, uh, Palo Alto Research Center or UT Austin, they all have, uh, you know, groups, you know, beyond these groups I, I, I listed, there are other groups as well who focus on the printing electronic studies. And over here in the Midwest area, my group and some other groups from UIUC and the companies like Powerfilm Solar, they are all focusing on the printing electronics as well. So different groups and also on the uh, East Shore, uh, there, are, there is the NC State University where I graduated, my advisor, Dr. Jin Yan Dong, who also focus on printing electronics. Those are the basic information about uh, printing in, uh, electronics. Due to the time limitation, I did not uh, get into details of uh, literature review, but if you Google the names that are listed here, you will also be able to identify those uh, you know, famous groups who work on the study in this field. My research in this area is also uh, you know, to develop uh, new manufacturing processes that can achieve uh, certain new, new devices and new applications. The core techniques that my group have is called electrohydrodynamic inkjet printing. So the idea of uh, electrohydrodynamic inkjet printing is too long. I will just use e-jet printing for short. The idea for e-jet printing is that for all the printing techniques, we need to have a drive force to drive the material flow. So the material flow can be gravity. The material flow can be a piezo film to drive the material out from the nozzle. It can be a squeeze function to squeeze the ink out from the nozzle. The idea is to use a driven force to drive the ink out from a nozzle so that we can achieve droplet-based printing. E-jet printing is utilizing electrical force. Okay? It's not acoustic force. It's not a piezo-based forces. It's using electrical force to pull the material, a conductive material, from a nozzle so that it can achieve micro nanoscale 3D printing. That's where my research is focusing on. Currently, our sponsor, including uh, NSF, NASA, Iowa Energy Center, and uh, Flexitech. So this, uh, you know, the, I, I will briefly introduce you the, the fundamental theories and get into certain applications where we can collaborate on. As I mentioned, you know, the, the fundamental idea for e jet printing is to apply a high voltage and use electrical force to drive the ink flow out from the nozzle. And then this, uh, uh, this while we apply the, 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 the high voltage, what will happen is uh, the high voltage will drag, drag the ink and form a kind of a cone shape over here. This cone shape is called Taylor cone. And then if the ink, the, the electrical force is big enough, the, uh, the electrical force will overcome the surface tension of the ink. So there is only a small drip is going to form at the tip of the nozzle. Okay, that's how we can achieve the printing in a micro nanoscale. So the electrical force will only form a drip only at the tip of the nozzle. That's how we reduce the dimension. For, for, a, for a nozzle with the size of a 20 micrometer, it is possible to achieve a three or four micrometer droplet generation. That, then we achieve the micro nanoscale printing. And the results that I have dated before shows that how precise the droplet can be. I can precisely print the droplets with the size between three to five nanometer, uh, micrometers. It can go as low as 500 nanometer as the diameter of the printed dots. This is the silver dots that uh, you know, I printed before. Of course, there will be articles that you can follow from our group uh, to learn more about this technique. For the printing, there are voltage applied. For the voltage itself, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we can control. We can use a DC voltage and we can also use an AC voltage. For DC voltage, there will be a few challenges. For instance, uh, uh, if the substrate is not conductive, the DC voltage printing will generate a charge accumulation, which will affect the future printing quality. So uh, uh, my work, you know, in my group, we use uh, pulsed AC voltage so that we can gen specifically control the droplet generation. We generate a positive, positively charge the droplet first, and then generate a negative charge to charge the uh, particle, and the two will neutralize each other. So that's how can we can achieve, uh, you know, good printing on any uh, substrate that we want. So this idea has been successfully implemented for device fabrication. So uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a few publications, you know, 
due to time limitation, I will move faster. We have a few publications that to print the touch sensors that uh, are using this uh, e-jet printing techniques. Again, if you want to learn more about these ideas, feel free to follow our publication publications. You can learn more from there. By making the touch sensors, that's a step forward where we can use this technique for making devices. And then uh, my research in this area also focuses on the in-situ monitoring and quality inspection. So uh, from this study, I, what I, my goal is to create a digital twin system and use the digital twin concept. It's manufacturing in micro nanoscale. We barely can use, we, we cannot use our eye to see what's going on. So by creating a digital twin system, it is also for us to create a real time virtual EJET printing so that we can know what part will be printed and how to ensure the quality assurance. That's some current ongoing effort that is sponsored by the previous uh, you know, listed indices. Uh, beyond the quality assurance, we also try to get the in-situ data from the uh, printing process itself and trying to see how this can be helpful to the physical modeling. We use the in-situ data for the physical modeling of the droplet impact behaviors and for also for the physical modeling of the material generation. That's some ongoing effort on the uh, in-situ monitoring data versus physical modeling aspect. Beyond the physical modeling, we also developed some fancy applications. Over here, I'm not sure if you've seen this news before. There are a lot of electronic devices that is being hacked these days. What happens is uh, there are you know, a tiny chips that can be inserted into the motherboard of the computer devices. Those chips are so small that it's barely to be de detected. So, uh, we cannot, uh, you know, my work is uh, trying to see if there are any ways that we can, you know, make the hack happen. So we started, you know, to work on developing of new inks that can be useful for radiation-based inspection. So the ink that we are developing is a tungsten-based ink. I think this, you know, uh, maybe I'm not wrong, but I can barely, very confident to claim that this is uh, one of the few studies that you will see related to the development of a tungsten nano ink that can be used for 3D printing. So we, we, we synthesize the tungsten ink, uh, you know, and then print the ink and then apply the ink onto circular circuits. And eventually those tungsten ink can block the X-ray radiation very effectively. This can be used for, you know, uh, some, uh, you know, aerospace related applications. For instance, you know, we've been supported by NASA to continue this study to see if we can de develop, develop uh, tungsten-based sensors that can block the radiation so, so that this uh, technique can be used for in-space manufacturing. So those are the possible applications. This is uh, also published as a journal article, so you can find more information over there. So other ongoing efforts related to micro nano printing in my group is, uh, of course, is the physical modeling. And uh, since this work is uh, supported by uh, some uh, uh, you know federal agency that uh, we uh, you know some some information shouldn't be disclosed at at this stage. So I will not get into details of uh, how the physical modeling works or how the real application is. But uh, you know you know just to bring it up you know if you want to talk with me offline, feel free to do so. Okay, we also have uh, some uh, you know a lot of publications in the micro nano e jet printing. And uh, you can also follow our publication from my website. So this uh, eJet printing has been successfully used for certain NASA applications, aerospace applications. But I also believe this can be used for bell applications. So if I can print the bell films, it is possible for, the, for, for us to manufacture the bell sensors so that the piezoelectrical steam film can be used for bell implants and different applications. So if uh, uh, you know, there are any faculty from uh, your, uh, your department that is interested in, in, interest in this topic, feel free to talk with me on this. And finally, I want to get into the engineering education that I'm working on. So uh, now, you know, with the pandemic hitting on campus, it's very difficult to teach manufacturing processes because manufacturing processes require hands-on work. And then uh, it's uh, dangerous at these days due to COVID-19. So I started to develop the virtual reality apps that can be used for manufacturing teaching. Over here is uh, you are seeing is some uh, 
a virtual app that our group have developed. So uh, uh, I will try to, you know, I'm not sure if, if you can hear the voices of this video, but I posted the link over here. Uh, How do we make it I believe you can, can you hear the voice? Can you hear? Yeah, but it's more coming through your mic. Okay. Yeah. So let's see if I can finish the planning of this video. It's only two minutes. Manufacturing lab is a vital constituent of being an engineer, which helps engineering students convert their theoretical knowledge into practical capability. But if we can increase the accessibility for engineers to train on machinery anywhere, anytime in the world, we can continue training students with hands-on learning. This will guarantee quality learning safely so that our students won't fall behind. That's why, over at Viratech, our programmers and engineers are working together to develop a smart virtual reality system utilizing Oculus VR headsets for engineering students to continue manufacturing lab during and after the COVID-19 pandemic period. With our Viratech program, we can reduce the risk of infection, prolong student manufacturing lab training time, accommodate students with physical difficulties while decreasing the cost for maintaining the course, State. Students who have operated machinery in the comfort of their homes have reported learning how to safely operate basic machinery in less than one hour. Already having two working machines in our simulator, such as a lathe and a drill machine, we will continue to program and import more machine features into our virtual reality simulator to increase the quality of training and user efficiency in our future updates. Because we must be there for our students no matter the difficulties and uncertainty that face us. Our students are what will make this world a better. Yeah, so that's this short video to show you the current, um, you know, uh, my, uh, my effort on manufacturing education. So I, I also have Oculus over here, if you can see my video. Basically, basically students can put this virtual goggle in and they will be able to be trained at home just by very similar by, you know, with playing video games. So, uh, you know, uh, currently, this project is not funded, so I'm still looking for funding opportunities to uh, answer uh, IUSE and other opportunities. So, uh, you know, if uh, you know, you are also teaching some uh, courses related to manufacturing, and maybe you can utilize the app. Feel free to let me know when we possibly work together on the education aspect of the manufacturing courses. And then, uh, uh, next slide is. Uh, uh, a, a final summary, okay? So I uh, talked about the background introduction, concrete printing, biomaterial printing, metal printing, uh, micro nanoscale printing of electronics and uh, manufacturing education by my group. Overall, the goal is to facilitate some collaboration between ISU and OU. And then uh, uh, here I want, finally I want to uh, uh, thanks our sponsors and thanks uh, all my collaborators. I didn't list their, their names here, I have a long list of uh, collaborators. So uh, thank you all for the support. And what's more, more, what's more importantly, I also want to uh, thank my students who have uh, contributed to, to the work here, especially uh, for the one that you are seeing circled in red. This is my PhD student. His name is uh, Xiao Zhang. He's actually uh, graduating soon and he's in the job marketing looking for postdoc positions or faculty positions. So I'm not sure if you have openings in your, in your uh, institute or if anyone wants to hire a postdoc, but uh, you know, if uh, Xiao Zhang can be a sonar, I, I, I will guarantee that he will be a good, you know, uh, a good member to the community. I, I, I will also thank my other students who have supported the work that I just presented. And finally is uh, uh, my contact information, my website and the QR code. And I also want to mention that I'm not sure if uh, you know you know you are aware of that. We also have a Big Twelve Faculty Fellowship Program, where a faculty member can apply this uh, travel funding to stay at another Big Twelve institute for for some time. If you want to visit Iowa State University, feel free to contact me. I will be more than happy to host your visit. Of course, that will be after the pandemic has passed. And this is uh, the. OU link where the Big 12 faculty fellowship is there. For the talented you know, OU students, you know, here's my postdoc position opening. I'm currently in the hiring process of a postdoc student. So if you are graduating soon, 
and if you are interested in any of uh, my work there, feel free to reach out to me and uh, uh, you know apply for this position. And thank you everyone, and I look forward to see you at the basketball season. Football season has passed. We'll move on to the basketball and see how it goes. Thank you. That's uh, all my talk for today. And uh, any questions, feel free to ask. I do have some questions, but maybe Randy, you go first, and then I will have just some comments and questions. Oh, no, no, you, you lead the way. I was just pulling in my video so that we could all see each other. I will stop sharing so we can see each other. I want to see, I'm referring to some slides, and I want to see your idea about some of the topics. It was a very, very great and insightful presentation. I really enjoyed it. A lot of good news and a lot of good information regarding additive manufacturing techniques. I think it's very, very helpful even for us to see what the kind of area we need to focus on, what's the kind of novel things in this area. So there, I just got some comments. For example, in your slide 13, you are showing that, for example, about how you get kind of a scan from the road and you see the damages, and then you try to fix the damages by your 3D printing techniques. So one step I think is missing here, so it's kind of integrity of your printing. So in many cases, when, when you get like you have the whole picture of the damage, then you need to do certain analysis to understand how this damage, if you add any material, how this material can kind of have a bond with the previous material. And in this way, not only you, you do like the printing and you, you fix it, you also increase the integrity at that point. Are you doing that kind of analysis? For example, I take the scan, I do analysis to understand that, and then I see how can I change that damage to another shape and then add the material to that shape that can have a very good integrity when I add my 3D printing material. That's actually a very good point. You know, that's something that I am missing on my side. I haven't been doing that. But uh, you know the integrity is uh, something that uh, I want to do, but do not have expertise. So maybe later on I will follow up with you on this topic, and we can, you know, schedule a meeting to continue t the discussion with the integrity issues really inside um, 3D printing techniques. Okay, thank you. So another question is mm -hmm. that you talk about like uh, slide 34. You talk about adding a new layer and you do a scanning that's a very very good point because i remember when i was at ge we had to print a, a kind of metal printing we had we had to print something many times and like 20 times to get the good quality yeah. and you do like this scanning i think this is very very helpful so if you see a defect during the printing is there any way to fix that defect or you need to stop new printing? Uh, there, there, there are ways uh, to, to uh, we can stop the machine and trying to go back and fix. So what we do is uh, if there are defects happening, we can easily machine off the defects because you know this is a hybrid manufacturing system. We also have CNC inside the machine. We can machine off the defects and then just keep on printing on, on the newly machined surfaces. That's the advantage of uh, the hybrid manufacturing tech. Concept. So, and what when you finish the printing, so a lot of that kind of crack or something's happening is happen when you finish the printing and you want to call the parts and other things. Uh, is that any other way you can also control that kind of defects that might happen during the internal the internal defects cannot be scanned in situ right now. So the 3D scan, you only scan the external surfaces. Okay. We cannot scan inside what's inside. So that part is very difficult. Okay. So the only thing that we can think about is the possibility to add a ID current or acoustic sensing into the okay. system to detect that. But that cannot be achieved by current optical system. Okay. I'm sorry, my last, I'm sorry for a lot of questions. I'm trying to. Yeah. So 
that uh, macro printing is, is very, very interesting for me. But we have surface tension as it's something that is always kind of prohibiting you to go to that scale. So what do you do with surface tension when you get to that kind of level and you have a fluid that has that kind of uh, forces, but how, how do you manage that when you do like a printing or macro printing? So what, what we do now, you know, we also study on the ink. I have a collaborator, his name is Dot Jiang from Iowa State University. He's the expert in material science. So he can help to add a few, uh, you know, additives into the ink to tune the surface tension and the viscosity easily. So with that being said, you know, uh, the collaboration will really make uh, us a very strong team because we now can control the ink property easily. So for new materials, it's very easy for us to test the different metal nanoparticles and different materials in this case. Okay, very good. Thank you again. It was very, very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hantang. Uh, uh, you have very broad uh, field, <laughs> and then uh, I'm uh, very impressed uh, uh, with your presentation. So uh, regarding to the NDE, uh, so during the 3D printing, I saw you have some efforts on uh, the continued uh, monitoring the condition. So uh, is there any way uh, besides um, using the surface, uh, I think you use some uh, uh, photo or uh, some light methods, uh, to to scan the the surface during the printing um, process, uh, is there any way uh, to uh, to uh, quantify like uh, the bonding between the layers or uh, the deposition of the new materials? So uh, not only you can evaluate, but uh, maybe improve the printing um, process. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, uh, actually you mentioned the bonding force, so. Right now, based on, you know, we, we can only analyze the results based on the data we get. So the data we get is the 3D point cloud data of the surface topography. Mm -hmm. So what we can get is the distortion of the top surface. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are trying to do now, what we are trying to do now is based on the distortion, we are trying to estimate the residual stress. So based on the t distortion of the newly formed surface, we're trying to figure out what's the residual stress and mm -hmm. later on from the residual stress, it may be correlated to the bounding force, it may not. Currently, we do not have a good you know, device to measure the bounding forces yet. We do not have that at this moment, but uh, based on residual stress information later on, if we can get that est established, it is possible to you know, get a connection between the bounding as well. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hang Chong, uh, my name is Tanvi. I'm a graduate student of the AME department. Mm -hmm. I, I want to thank you for your uh, talk. This is really interesting. And yes. uh, I really uh, enjoyed it. You uh, covered a diverse area. Yes. So the first thing is uh, about the biomaterial 3D printing. I have just um, curiosity about it. Like, um, is there any, any uh, plan you have any plan for like to to do any 3d printed uh, biomaterial phantom for human body do you have any plan for something like that yes that's why i keep reaching out you know currently in my lab uh, it's a manufacturing lab i do not have uh, you know capability for cell culture and related studies so mm -hmm. i'm looking for collaborations where you know i can make certain devices and it can be tested elsewhere, where, you know, you know, for instance, if you have a self culture capability in your lab, I can send you the device, you can test how cell will grow on those devices. That mm -hmm. will be, you know, a, a, a step forward to this field. Okay, yeah, I, I just uh, think about like, um, as an example, like if, if we uh, want to print, uh, make a phantom for the research world, like the human head, so there are multiple layers of the human head. Mm -hmm. So if, if, it, if it is possible, like the biomaterial 3D printed human phantom that would be available for the research world, 
So it, it, it can be helpful for the researcher to test their like optical device, um, optical optical research for detecting the cancer or the head, head or strokes, something like that, or the microwave imaging, something like that. So I was just thinking about, is there any chance or you, you have any plan for this kind of research or? Okay. Yes, you know, I, actually uh, it is planned, uh, but I also have to say it depends on what type of collaborator that I can you know, find. So mm -hmm. as what you, the area you mentioned are very interesting, but they are out of my expertise. So there has to be a collaboration mechanism where we can utilize the expertise on both ends. So on my expertise on manufacturing and other expertise on the application you just mentioned, then merge together and generate more impacts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, yeah. kind reply. Yeah. I was just uh, wondering that there is any chance or not. That's it. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again. All right. Yes. I, I saw time is up. You know, first, thank you, everyone. You know, before I, I give this talk, my wife says, you know, it is a prime day. Everyone should be shopping. And it is midtime week over here at our OU. So <laughs> thank you for everyone who spent the time listening to the talk rather than going shopping. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Han Tang. Thank you. <laughs>